as you can see, Pastor Danny isn't here today. Um, so, um, Pastor Danny asked me if I would start preaching through 1 John. So, that's where we're going to start today. So, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. Verse 1. What was from the beginning, and what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. 1 John was written by the Apostle John toward the end of his life. In one way, you could say, that 1 John was written for combat. It is the writing of an old warrior shepherd defending his beloved sheep against those who would devour them. We see this over in chapter 2. If you, if you turn over to chapter 2, verse 26, he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. 1 John was written to counter deception and to neutralize wolves. And as we will see, this is true even within the first few verses of chapter 1. And just like today, the church in John's time was beset with foreign and hostile influences which were infiltrating the church and seeking to destroy it from the inside out. This has always been a challenge for the church. T.S. Eliot, who was considered to be one of the 20th century's greatest poets, was also a Christian. He was very concerned about this problem in the 20th century. He warned that, quote, paganism holds all the most valuable advertising space. Paganism holds all the most valuable advertising space. Paganism is everywhere around us, and it attacks the church in many forms. We are swimming in it. Um, what Mr. Elliot feared that as long as Christians were a tolerated minority, which, which is what we are now, the unconscious pressures of intellectual conformity with the broader culture would endanger the church's survival more than would open an active, more than, than would open an active persecution. So in other words, with regard to the life of the church, deception leaking into the church is a, is a greater threat than persecution. The church does not exist in isolation from the surrounding culture. This worldly culture inevitably poses a threat both externally from false religions and internally from false teachers. Or, or savage wolves, as the Apostle Paul puts it. We must remember that of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, only, only two were commended. The other five were rebuked for their worldliness and their toleration of false teachers. The world and its paganism had poisoned them. This was the majority of those churches. First John was written both to fortify God's people against false teachers and to reassure them that they possessed eternal life. The heresy that John is confronting here appears to be to, to have been a, a nascent or a, in seed form, a, some form of Gnosticism, which became more fully developed later on. Um, so John considered the blending of Gnosticism with Christianity as a threat to Christian doctrine and to the life of the church. In Gnostic thought, the body and the physical world are seen as, as evil, while the spiritual realm over here was seen as a superior good. The mystical uh, spiritual realm is good. 
This dualistic thinking led them to accept some form of Christ's deity, but they denied his humanity. They denied that he had truly come in the flesh. Um, the material world was considered tawdry or, or dirty. And it, and it would therefore be unworthy of God to take on human flesh. They taught that Jesus' body was not a real physical body. The, it only appeared to be so. So by, by their estimation, by the Gnostic estimation, because Jesus had not come in the flesh, he had to have been some kind of spiritual or mystical apparition appearing to the minds of his followers, uh, but not truly physical. He could never have taken on a physical body because of the inherent evil of the natural physical world. So you see that the presuppositions of the Gnostics drove their view of what is allowed in Christian theology. The Apostle John speaks directly to this. Turn over to chapter 1, oh, I'm sorry, turn over to 1 John chapter 4, verse, 12, uh, verse 2. It says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So come in the flesh. And then turn over to 2 John, verse 7. It says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. So the way that the, the Gnostic heresy worked out in John's time was that it affected Christology. So you, they didn't have a, a correct or an adequate view of who Jesus was because of their Gnostic commitments. Now we're not necessarily facing that here in our culture, but we are still facing the worldview of Gnosticism, which has, which has other entailments that we must push back against, even if it's not the same ones that John was pushing back against. To the Gnostic, the body is just a contaminated prison where the spirit is incarcerated. And so because of this, they, they were indifferent to moral values and the need for ethical behavior as believers. Sinfulness in the members of their flesh had no connection to or effect on the spirit. To a Gnostic, you could be considered right with God while sin raged in your body, in your outward behavior. And we have all met people like this. They, they will tell us what matters is the heart. What matters is the heart, regardless of whatever sins have been committed in the body or are still being actively pursued in the body. They will tell us, quote, look, I know I do bad things, but I have a good heart. Yeah, I know I haven't kept the Ten Commandments and I still don't keep them, but God sees my heart. He sees that I'm a good person on the inside who has good motives. So see, this is a separation of the, the spiritual from the physical and acting like they have nothing to do with each other. That is Gnostic thinking. 1 John has much to say about this. Turn, turn back over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. It says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. As you keep reading through um, 1 John, you will see that, that this idea is a major theme in 1 John that, that, that he's writing about. Additionally, in the Gnostic view, truth, truth itself cannot be ascertained from the physical world because the physical world is corrupt. So knowledge, so, so this is a, an epistemo, epistemological claim made by the Gnostics. Knowledge for them comes through, through a, a, a connection to a, a mystical realm 
that is completely separate from that which can be known through the physical senses. So personal perception is taken to be, uh, so personal mystical perception is taken to be a higher form of knowledge than objective, observable reality. And, and this is the driving force behind our, our culture's out of control drive towards transgenderism. Michael O'Fallon explains this connection between Gnosticism and transgenderism very well. Um, transgenderism challenges the traditional understanding of gender as being rooted in biological sex. The argument goes that, that gender identity is a matter of personal perception. So, so there's the mysticism. It's a matter of personal perception rather than objective reality. By divorcing gender identity from biological sex, transgenderism implicitly indicates that the body's physical attributes are somehow lesser than one's self than one's self perception when it comes to truth. So, in essence, the, the victims of transgender ideology are taught to believe that their body is a prison. Their body is a prison, and by by attaining or obtaining knowledge of their true self, their true mystical self, and undergoing life-altering surgery, they are, quote, liberated from this prison that is their body. Both Gnosticism and transgenderism challenge traditional notions of objective truth. In Gnosticism, truth, it, was often seen as a subjective experience that one could only achieve through direct mystical revelation. And, and I, don't, I won't go into it, but, but that is a charismatic theology. That is a whole branch of charismatic theology. The mystical revelation is, is more important than, than the revelation we have in God's Word. In the same way, the transgender movement embraces the idea of self-discovery and personal truth, small t truth. They emphasize that only the individual, only the individual truly knows their gender identity. The rest of us have no clue. Like they, they, they are the, their own elite <laughs> as far as knowledge. This is a rejection of objective truth, truth that is based on, on biological, physical facts. It is a fundamental departure from, a, from an objective understanding of what it means to be male and female. It's, it's Gnostic at its core. The roots of transgender... Uh, so, so, so the argument I'm making is that transgenderism goes all the way back to the Gnosticism that the Apostle John was arguing against here in 1 John. To the Gnostic of John's time, this mystical subjective connection gave the Gnostics um, special knowledge that is required for salvation. And only certain people have this mystical connection. Only certain people. And, uh, and, and this mystical connection gives them a, spe a special knowledge that no one else has. They just know and you don't. They just know and you don't. Those who had special knowledge were, were part of the insiders club. Think, uh, think the, the popular group in high school or junior high. <laughs> and everyone else was outside. Those who believed they had this special knowledge viewed themselves as the spiritual elite who alone had true knowledge. These elite scorned the unenlightened um, plebes like us who were bereft of this knowledge, of the special knowledge. These elite were arrogant, they were unholy, and they were loveless towards the, the, the regular people. But the Apostle John explains that such lack of love, excuse me, does not mark those who truly have a higher knowledge of God. It's not a good sign for them, but rather it marks them as those who do not know him at all. 
John states this repeatedly throughout his epistle. And in chapter 2, verse 9, he says, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And chapter 4, verse 8, says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then chapter 4, verse, verse 20, If someone says, quote, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the love, or for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So you cannot say that you know God if you do not love your brother. The book of, of 1 John begins with an account of the nature and character of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll notice that John doesn't, doesn't mention his name, but he expects them all to know who he is speaking of. In the first, so if you turn back to chapter 1, he expects them all to know who he's speaking of. He is the great foundation and object of our faith and our hope. He is our advocate and mediator that cements us to God with a bond that can never be broken. He is the one before, before whom the demons tremble. All creation bows before him, and he is the source of all light and life. He is the self-existent one. Because he has life in himself, we can have life. There is, there is so much that can be said about him. And he should be well known by all of us for our own good and delight and for his glory. So, looking at the text again in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, we see that there are five what's. If you look at the text, you'll see five what's. Verse 1, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and touched with our hands. And then down in verse 3, again, it says, what we have seen and heard. The focus of the first what is the, is the otherworldliness or the, the transcendence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, <clears throat> what was from the beginning. We cannot say this about any other man. This means, among other things, that he has lived a really, really long time. And not only this, he existed before all of creation, and as such, he is the fountain of all life. His duration shows his excellency. He was from eternity, and as such, he is essential and uncreated. This man, Jesus, was there when the foundations of the earth were laid. He was there when God sent a flood to destroy the whole earth. He was there when Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldees to become Abraham. He was there when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He heard the groans and the cries for succor from the children of Israel in slavery in Egypt. He was there when Moses parted the Red Sea. This man has been involved in all of history since the beginning of time. So not only was he there at the creation of all things, this man, Jesus Christ, was himself the one actually laying the foundations of all creation. He wasn't just watching. First John, turn over to, first, uh, to John, the book of John, chapter 1. Verse 3. It says that all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So this man, I'll read it again. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that that has come into being. So this man... Jesus Christ created all of reality as we know it. 
everything that exists. There is nothing that exists that does not exist by His will. Galaxies, planets, stars, supernovas, oceans, spider webs, trees, whales, sunsets, cool, bra- cool breezes on a hot day. They were all this man's idea. They were all this man's idea. He is no normal man. Turn with me over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, I'll wait for you to get there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or authorities, all things have been been created by him and for him. So all authority structures have been created by him. Cities, towns, counties, states, nations, churches, families, all of human civilization and authority structures were all his idea. Again, this is no normal man that John is writing about. Look at verse, look at verse 17. It says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the creator of all things, he is the sustainer of all things. He quite quite literally holds all things together. This man's power is present in every atom, every molecule, every apple, table, planet, solar system, refrigerator. He is holding it all together actively. And Hebrews says he's doing it by the word of his power. Everything is held together by him. Okay, turn with me back to to 1 John chapter 1. As we, continue, <clears throat> as we continue through the text, we see that the next four what's are not about his transcendence, but they are about his earthly existence and his historical existence. This man who was from the beginning is a man who lived on the earth at a certain point in history. It says, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and touched with our hands. So what John is saying here is that that the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of history, became an actual character in his own story in history. Indeed, from the beginning, the Christian gospel consisted in an account of something that had happened in the real physical world at a real point in time. And you cannot separate the Christian gospel from history. You cannot do it. The great, the great weapon with which the disciples of Jesus set out to conquer the world was not a, a mere comprehension of eternal principles, as the Gnostics would say. It was an historical message, an account of something, uh, an account of something that had just recently happened. An account of something that had just recently happened. Their message was, we knew him, we heard him, we saw him, we touched him with our hands. He was crucified, dead, and buried, and we we beheld him risen from the dead. Christianity doesn't exist without that. It would not have ever even gotten off the ground if it was some mystical idea in the heads of these disciples. Christianity has always been history united together with, in an indissoluble union with doctrine. History and doctrine united. That's what it's always been. Scripture says Christ died. That is history. And it also says Christ died for our sins. That is doctrine. Without these two elements, history and doctrine, you don't have Christianity. Theological liberals want to separate the doctrine from the history. 
Um, and, and my own father was, was a, a preacher of this type. They will say that it doesn't matter whether Jesus really physically rose from the dead or not. What matters is that the life of Jesus lives on in your heart. It doesn't matter if he was truly born of a virgin. What matters is that the inspiration that his life gives to those who are going through suffering. But the Apostle Paul's answer to this in 1 Corinthians 15 is that if Christ has not risen from the dead, we are fools. And we follow a worthless religion. So verse 1, um, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 says, What we have heard. What was it that John and the other apostles heard? They heard his sermons. They heard his parables. The teaching he gave to the disciples in private. They heard the voice of God thunder on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. This voice so terrified them that they couldn't stand up. John remembered this well. They heard Him command Lazarus to come out of the tomb. They heard Him confound the Jewish leaders with His questions. In fact, for John, he was the smartest person Jesus was the smartest person that he had ever met. They heard him command demons who were always terrified of him. They heard him rebuke the wind and the waves and calm the stormy sea. The verb structure of, of what we have heard indicates a, a complete occurrence in the past that has lasting impact in the present and on into the future. So these things that John heard were not just a matter of interesting uh, historical trivia. Even though he was writing this letter some 60 years later, after the events, what he heard from Jesus firsthand had become a vivid part of who he was in the present. And that's what it's meant to be for us. The text goes on to say, what we have seen with our eyes now, it's interesting that he, that he threw in the phrase, with our eyes. Like, that seems redundant. And this is important, as the Gnostics claim to see, to see spiritual truths with their mystical eyes. So, so, some current Gnostics call this their third eye, or the mystical eye. And you've seen that in movies where a character will have a, an eye appear in the middle of their forehead. It's their mystical eye. John wanted them to understand that Christ was not seen through some spiritual vision that was only part of a mystical perception. Jesus was not a mystical phantom or phenomenon. He was a real man that John had observed daily for three years by, by means of ordinary eyesight. So what did John and the other apostles see? They saw water poured into pots at the Canaanite wedding, and then they saw it come out as wine. They watched him cleanse the temple with the whip. They saw him heal a blind man. They watched withered arms and legs become whole right in front of them. They saw the Holy Spirit come down to rest on him at his baptism. They watched him walk on water. They watched with wonder as he continued to tear pieces off of the same five barley loaves, enough to feed 5,000 men and their families. They watched a fig tree die after he cursed it. They saw the tears roll down his face as he wept for Jerusalem and the hardness of the people's hearts. They saw the calluses on his hands from his, from his family's carpentry business. They'd seen the sorrow on his face upon hearing that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed by Herod. They watched him pick a slave's ear up off the ground and reattach it after Peter had cut it off. They saw him hanging, bleeding, dying, and dead upon the cross, and they saw him after his resurrection from the dead. 
verse 1 goes on to say what we beheld. And this led me to one of my first questions I had when I started studying this text. The text says, what we have seen with our eyes and what we have beheld. And uh, I didn't know how to answer that question. So what is the difference between seeing with your eyes and beholding something? Turn with me over to John chapter 1, verse 45. John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses wrote in the law, and the prophets also wrote. Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good be from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Here is a truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Let me pause there. So up to this point, Nathanael sees a man sitting or standing before him. And as far as he knows, he doesn't know the man. And this man has just said something very confusing. Put yourself in Nathanael's shoes right now. Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So after hearing Jesus' display of omniscience, he comes to understand who Jesus truly is. Before he was just seeing him, but, but now he beholds the reality of who Jesus is. So the disciples did not just hear and see Jesus, they beheld him in the reality of his person in the same way that the Israelites beheld the bronze serpent in faith and were healed. To behold him was to put, put everything together of what they had seen and heard and recognize him for what he was, the Lord of all creation, sent to win a people for himself. The, their senses informed their mind, and their mind put the pieces together and recognized him and came to believe in him. So in other words, they beheld him. The text goes on to say what, what our hands have handled in verse 1. This surely refers to the physical evidence that he offered to his disciples of the reality and solidity of his resurrection body. He shows them the wounds in his hands and in his side. John remembered that Thomas professed unbelief unless he could place his hands in Jesus' wounds. He appeared to Thomas in the presence of the others in order to satisfy Thomas's doubts. And, they, and I would imagine that there were probably others who also wanted to touch the wounds. In addition to this, we know that the Apostle John, in particular, had a physical a physically affectionate relationship with Jesus. It was John who described himself as the one who leaned back on, on Jesus' chest. The apostles would have touched Jesus all the time in the daily interactions with him throughout the course of their three years of companionship with him. So what we see here in all of this is that the Lord is no despiser of sense testimony of our senses and the testimony that they give us. Our senses, in their place and sphere, are a means that God has appointed and which the Lord Jesus Christ employed for the sake of convincing his disciples and ultimately us. The Lord took special care to satisfy all the senses of the apostles in order that they would be his authentic witnesses. There was a reason that, that all but John died a horrible death, never denying what they had seen and heard. Matthew Henry says this, 
He says that the rejection of the Christian revelation is at last resolved into the rejection of sense itself. It's a rejection of sense itself. They saw and heard something and they sealed their testimony with their blood. Turn with me over to Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Mark 16, verse 14. It says, Later he appeared to the eleven disciples themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reprimanded them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen from the dead. So we see here that Jesus reprimands the ones who would not believe the testimony of those who had seen him risen from the dead. See, lack, lack of evidence is not the issue here. Multiple people heard him and saw him, and they, and they testified that, that it had truly happened. And we have their testimony and their sense experience here in our hands, in the testimony that we have written down. It, it is simple hardness of heart that refuses to believe the historical events and their correspondent theological meaning. In the same way that Jesus rebuked his disciples for not believing the testimony of the ones who had actually seen him right then, at the end of time, in the day of judgment, he will rebuke all those who did not believe upon hearing of this same testimony. We see it here, I'm sorry, back over to 1 John. Um, we also see that the text, um, that Jesus is called the word of life in verse 1, and he is also called the eternal life in verse 2. So starting in verse, verse 2, we, we see the use of the word manifested two times. To manifest something means to take the covering off. Something exists in a hidden state, in a container, and you have to remove the lid to see what's inside. This word of life, who is eternal life, who was from the beginning, has always existed, but in a veiled way. He's always existed, but in a veiled way. And also his plan for the ultimate display of his glory and his character has always existed, but it, but it too was hidden behind a mystery. And, and in the incarnation of Christ, what had always been true about who God was, his nature and his character, and what his plan was for the nation was made manifest. So it's, it was always there, it was always true, but the cover was taken off. And here in verse 2, the disciples do three things for us. They see, they testify, and they proclaim. The Lord Jesus handpicked these men to see and hear things. And then commissioned them to testify of the facts of what they'd seen. That's history and then proclaim what it means. That's doctrine. Again, historical accounts and doctrine go together inseparably in Christianity. So in one sense, these men are the spiritual elite of Christianity, right? But they are not like the Gnostic elite. There are no closely guarded secrets that only the elite have access to in Christianity. There are no secret rituals or knowledge of, of any kind in Christianity. What the disciples were given, what the disciples were given, they turned around and they have given it all to us. They were a, they were a flowing river of information, not a reservoir meant to just keep it all together. Everything they saw and know is ours. Everyday believers are able to know the truth without needing a Gnostic elite who have some kind of, of secret knowledge that we don't have access to. 
Charles Hodge says this, the Bible is a plain book. It is intelligible by the people. And they have the right and are bound to read and interpret it for themselves so that their faith may rest on the testimony of Scripture and not on that of the church. This is the one big difference between Christianity and Roman Catholicism, among others. We don't have a priesthood to tell us how to read and interpret Scripture. This was one of the, one of the hard-fought battles of the Reformation. The responsibility to read and interpret Scripture belongs to each one of us. Now, Pastor Danny helps us along with this, but he is not the final authority. He is not a member of some, inno- some Gnostic elite with secret knowledge that we can only get through him. Scripture is our final authority. So those who, those who have been touched by the gospel of Christ want nothing more but to have others happy in that same gospel, sharing the same privileges, forgiveness of sins, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit living in us, sharing the same privileges as they do. This is why we preach and teach. Donald Cargill Um, was one of the Scottish covenanters who who gave his life for the lordship of Christ over his church in the 17th century. He said this, no sooner has, and imagine a Scottish accent, I can't do it. (laughs) No sooner has Christ become all in all to a soul, but the next wish of that soul The next wish of that soul is, oh, that he were so to all the world. Let me read it again. No sooner has Christ become all in all to his soul, but the next wish of that soul is, oh, that he were so to all the world. I wish all the world could know this. This is why John says what he says in verse 4. He says, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. The Apostle John's joy was wrapped up in their joy in Christ, in their belief, in their faith. Turn over to 3 John verse 4. It echoes the same thing. It says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. This is the heart cry of of every true Christian pastor and elder. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Paul charges Timothy to guard the treasure that has been entrusted to him in the gospel. According to John, the way that we guard the gospel is by keeping it pure and by giving it away. By keeping it pure and giving it away to the nations. So in conclusion, Jesus' disciples truly had an, ex- an historical experience of a man that lived with them for three years. He is like no other man that has ever existed, that has ever been known. John saw him die on a cross, and all of them saw him risen from the dead. They have passed on to us what they saw, heard, and touched. They have kept nothing from us. And we can be confident in this, that we have been given everything we need in the scriptures for life and godliness. Let's pray. Lord, we we thank you for what you have done for us in the testimonies that have been written down by the men who who lived with you and walked with you, even one of your brothers, James. We thank you for the fact that that they loved well, that they gave information freely, that they they were not, um, they were not hoarders of the truth. 
for political gain. In fact, they all ended up giving their lives, and we thank you for this man, for these men that you handpicked and you gave this message. You let them see you, you let them hear you, and walk with you and touch you. And, uh, and we thank you that we, we have this treasure of your word in our hands. And we thank you that, um, that we don't have to go anywhere else. We don't have to seek some elusive, mystical connection to the ethereal realm somewhere. But we have an objective, truthful reality in our hands. And Lord, we, we thank you that, um, that you gave them this desire, this joy to see this replicated throughout the earth. And I pray that you would do the same for us. In Jesus' name, amen.